Hello everyone, this uh, short breakout video is accompanying our BIS 103 Lecture 3 on glycolysis. And what I want to discuss in this um, shorter video is the important first reaction of glycolysis with focus on its mechanism and the important role of ATP in this reaction and how it contributes to the bioenergetics of this reaction. So let's dive in. Here's our first reaction of glycolysis. This is how we enter this pathway. And you can see this in the main part of our lecture three, how the entire pathway works. Here, I just want to focus on the first reaction. And what is happening here is that we are phosphorylating glucose as our hexose sugar going in as the main entry point of glycolysis and it's phosphorylated at carbon six here. So what we're doing is we're attaching a phosphoryl group. So it's a group transfer of a phosphoryl group to carbon six of glucose. And so this reaction is crucially important for glycolysis for a number of reasons. Um, there's sort of three major ones I have listed here. Firstly, by phosphorylating glucose, we're actually reducing the concentration of glucose in the cell. That allows us to actually continue to bring in glucose into the cell to be used in glycolysis. If you remember your previous courses on concentration gradients and osmotic potential that you may have seen, that if you are bringing in too much, if the concentration of a metabolite rises too much, the gradient will be non-favorable to bringing in more of this metabolites throughout a membrane. By converting glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, we are reducing the concentration of glucose within the cell. Therefore, we can continue to bring more glucose in. Obviously important because that's our food for glycolysis. Secondly, by converting it to a phosphorylated compound, we can prevent glucose from leaking from the cell. Phosphorylating a compound will increase its polarity and thereby reduce its potential to passively um, go across the membrane so we can trap it within the cell, making sure that it's used for glycolysis. And thirdly here, attaching this phosphoryl group activates glucose. You will see that it's a very good leaving group and is providing additional energy for further conversion of glucose throughout glycolysis. So here are the three major regions of why this is such an important step. So it being so important, I want to discuss how it actually works and also remind us of what we had discussed in the last lecture in lecture two about using Gibbs free energy for predicting pathway directionality and for predicting whether or not a reaction is thermodynamically possible. So this now can actually allow us to apply this knowledge to gathering ideas on how this first step of glycolysis could actually be accomplished. So how could we do this? Right? One possibility here is that we take glucose and we simply attach inorganic phosphate, which actually exists in our bloodstream in form of phosphoric acid here. And we can then, by attaching inorganic phosphate, create glucose 6-phosphate as our product. Right? So that's one hypothesis. How can we prove this? Right? The first thing we can do is, is to measure the presence and concentrations of these pathway components in a cell. And up here in the right corner, I have sort of a table of concentrations of these different fossil pathway components in red blood cells in erythrocytes. And you see here, glucose, this is sort of the common concentration of glucose you have in your bloodstream. It should be around five millimolar. We have a lower concentration of glucose 6-phosphate here. As I said, we also have inorganic phosphate actually present in our bloodstream. And also, right, we had talked about our common currency metabolite, ATP and ADP already to some degree in lecture two. That also is present at lower concentration of bloodstream. So these are the components we can think about. Now, if we look at this pathway, right, how could we calculate whether this in fact is um, the right pathway? So we can apply our formula on um, delta G0 prime. And if we remember it, we can combine the gas constant at the temperature with the natural log of Kq under standard conditions. How can this now work, right? If this actually has been calculated and you can find this in your textbook as the delta G0 prime for this reaction actually is plus 
almost 14 kilojoule per mole. Now, if you remember our discussion on Gibbs free energy, we had said, right, if the delta G0 prime is high, larger than zero, the reaction is not fluxing spontaneously left to right. So this indicates that the reaction hypothesized here would not be thermodynamically favorable. But we had also said that like what we care for, what's the really criterion is for biochemical reactions are the non-standard conditions. Right? And so we have a different formula here. Remember this one, right? Under cellular conditions, we had our delta G combining now the standard delta G zero prime with our gas continent temperature and the natural log of Q, our mass action ratio that now takes into account the concentrations of the reactants and products. So if we do this, right, our product is glucose 6-phosphate, our reactants are glucose and inorganic phosphate. We can get those from up here from our table, right, so we can plug them in. And keep in mind, right, our um, delta G is given in mole. Here we have millimoles, so always pay good attention to your units that you have them right, so we have to take this into account here. And if we do this calculation, what we get is a delta G of plus almost 21 kilojoule per mole. So it's even more positive than under standard conditions. So the conclusion you can draw here without even having done an experiment at this stage is that under these conditions, whether they're um, standard or under cellular conditions, these are not thermodynamically favorable. This is likely not our pathway. So we have to come up with a new hypothesis. Right? So another hypothesis could be that we're using ATP and not inorganic phosphate, right? our common currency. So what would this look like? Right? Again, we could think about this reaction, but we could now combine it with ATP. Okay? And so this reaction now could be combined in a total reaction where we actually use glucose, but we're bringing in ATP. We have glucose 6-phosphate, and now the phosphoryl group came from ATP to glucose, and we are releasing ADP, so adenosine diphosphate has lost one phosphate now. If you now do the same calculations for our delta G0 prime, like we said, this original one here was 13.9 kilojoule per mole, what has been measured for the hydrolysis of ATP, that's actually negative, that's minus 30.5 or thereabouts. And we had also now said, right, pathways cooperate. Because of that, the delta G0 primes are additive, so we can add this for the total reaction, and what we come out at is a delta G0 prime of minus almost 17 kilojoule per mole. So this now is lesser than zero, so this, theoretically should flux from left to right. So this already looks much better, right? Under standard conditions. Again, we want to understand what's happening under cellular conditions. So here's our formula again, right? Now using Q, we can tap in our products and our reactants just as before. And you can do this at home and see if you come to the same result as I did using the values you have up here in your table. And now our delta G actually is even more negative, around minus 33 kilojoule per mole. So using these types of um, calculations, we can use Gibbs free energy to predict if one of our hypotheses on how a pathway can work might be correct and can actually guide our experimental work. And so this, at least from these calculations, thermodynamically is our pathway, right? So we're not using inorganic phosphate, we are much more likely using ATP as our donor for the phosphorylation of glucose. So having that said, we should really look at this molecule. This is ATP or adenosine triphosphate. I, you should be able to recognize it. I would not ask you to draw it, but you should be able to recognize the structure. And what you have here, right, is an adenine backbone then you have a ribose, so that's a pentose, a five carbon sugar that's attached to it. And the sugar backbone now contains really the business end of ATP, which is this phosphate, these phosphate groups here. And what you can see here is that you have one group here, 
This is a phosphoester bond, and we'll see later why this is important. And then the two other phosphoryl groups here are attached as phosphoanhydride groups. Right? So these are now oxygens here that are containing two phosphoryl groups attached to these others. These are phosphoanhydride bonds. And the difference between the phosphoester bond and the phosphoanhydride bonds I'll actually will show you another breakout video where we are looking at high energy compounds. These are important for the energy that is actually contained in these bonds. Right. Another important fact you might want to think about is that actually in our blood, the ATP that's actually being used, you usually have these phosphoryl groups bound to magnesium atoms. Right. And this is important because it actually is required for the enzymes that are using ATP. And it has to also to do with the possibility of breaking these bonds. If we remember our discussion on some of the organic chemistry and the carbonyl groups, right? we had carbonyl groups here also, we have now a phosphoryl atom attached to an oxygen. And the same is true that the oxygen will draw electrons from the phosphate here therefore leaving a partially positive charge around the phosphate and the magnesium atoms increase this effect even more, facilitating the weakening of these bonds and the eventual breaking of these bonds for hydrolysis of ATP. All right. So when we do this, right, if we break these bonds, what we had said, right, one of our products is ADP, so the diphosphate shown here, so what you have lost now is one of these phosphoanhydride bonds, right? The outer phosphoryl group has gone, now attached to glucose to more make glucose 6-phosphate. You can also go further. You can cleave the secondary phosphoanhydride bond and you come to the monophosphate or AMP, which only has this one phosphoester bond left. And this actually is really important. The phosphoester bond has much less energy than a phosphoanhydride bond. And so AMP is actually a signal in your body that signals low energy. It's a warning signal that says, I'm really running out of energy. So it's a very important molecule for this purpose. Because of this, we actually have an enzyme that can deal with the situation because AMP is such a strong signal for low energy and is triggering a whole number of pathways in response, we actually have an enzyme called the adenylate kinase, and that's one that you might want to remember, that can actually regenerate ADP from AMP. And the way this works is that we're using molecules of ATP, so the triphosphate, we combine it with AMP, and what we can generate now is two ADP. Okay. Because we are breaking and regenerating the same number of phosphoanhydride bonds, this actually has a KQ of one, so this fluxes very easily in both directions. Right? So it doesn't actually take a lot of energy. So you might think, why is this even important? It's actually important, A. Like I said, AMP is a very strong low energy signal but also ADP is actually our substrate for making ADP, which is what we will see when we talk about the electron transfer chain, but it's critically important that we maintain um, a concentration of ADP in order to actually make more ATP. So this is very different now to the actual hydrolysis of ATP. And this is a reaction that I just showed you that we can use to combine it with the phosphorylation of glucose. And if we do this, right, we have an enormously large KQ here of almost 140. And if you remember our discussion on the relationship of KQ and our Gibbs free energy, a large KQ means a very negative Gibbs free energy. So this reaction fluxes very strongly from left to right and is irreversible because of that. Right. So now that we can understand ATP is really important for providing the energy for realizing the phosphorylation of glucose, we want to look a little bit on how it works mechanistically. What actually is happening here, right? we don't have two different reactions in that sense. In the enzyme, it is one combined reaction where 
the alcohol group here that is to be phosphorylated of glucose will actually act as a nucleophile and attack now this phosphoryl group here remember i had said right because of the oxygen drawing away electrons this it has a partial positive charge acts as an electrophile so this oxygen can attack the phosphoryl group and facilitate this cleavage so this is probably a good time to briefly talk about nucleophiles and electrophiles to sort of refresh everyone from our organic chemistry classes what are these so nucleophiles usually are compounds that are electron rich right so they can donate electrons and these are usually hydroxyl groups and we'll see some examples of sulfhydryl groups these are the two important ones we'll see there are some others that you don't have to focus on too much another one that i would say is important here are the carbanions also right, resulting from carbon carbon cleavage reactions where you have carbons that are left with a higher number of electrons these are the major nucleophiles that we'll be touching on here for our bis 103 class the opposing partner are electrophiles so these are compounds that are electron deficient right and so one of the major ones are the protons here and we'll see how they are being used in biochemistry throughout our lectures on, on this 103 the carbonyl carbon like i said right is positively charged partially because of the electrons being drawn for the oxygen so that acts as an electrophile we will see some reactions not too many um, in our case for carbo cations that can do this and most importantly for us also this phosphorus group here on inorganic phosphate for the same effect as for the carbonyl carbon the phosphorate is partially positively charged acting as an electrophile so again going back to our reaction here now we can understand how it works right the attack of the hydroxyl group here as a nucleophile on the phosphorus group as an electrophile can facilitate the cleavage of the phosphorus and hydride bond and the attachment of the phosphoryl group to the alcohol of glucose making glucose 6-phosphate and the enzyme that does this is a hexokinase so a kinase that uses hexoses as substrates right? and keep in mind the kinase is an enzyme that will facilitate phosphorylation and importantly so using atp as a donor of the phosphoryl group so here is then the result of this reaction and now we have glucose 6-phosphate and we have atp minus one of its phosphoanhydride bonds have generated adp all right so this is for the next breakout session so i'll end this video here and you can follow up through the main lecture video on glycolysis